Welcome to the Medieval Tales Podcast, a podcast reading classic medieval novels for your listening and enjoyment. The first book we're going to be reading is Black Arrow by Robert Louis Stevenson. It's set during the Wars of the Roses and follows young Dick Shelton, son of Sir Harry Shelton. Now, Stevenson may be best known for his books Treasure Island and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but he was a prolific writer with over 12 novels, dozens and dozens of short stories, poems, travel writing, and even a play. Now, I first read The Black Arrow when I was a young teenager and loved the medieval setting and the adventure. Stevenson has a way of writing that draws you in and is captivating throughout the whole story. Now, in part one, we're going to listen to the prologue and chapters one and two. Now, The Black Arrow is read by Mark Smith. So grab yourself a cup of mead or tea, whatever your fancy is. Find a cozy place to sit and enjoy The Black Arrow. The Black Arrow by Robert Louis Stevenson forward. Critic on the hearth. No one but myself knows what I have suffered, nor what my books have gained, by your unsleeping watchfulness and admirable pertinacity. And now here is a volume that goes into the world and lacks your imprimatur. A strange thing in our joint lives, and the reason of it stranger still. I have watched with interest, with pain, and at length with amusement, your unavailing attempts to peruse the black arrow, and I think I should lack humor indeed if I let the occasion slip and did not place your name in the fly-leaf of the only book of mine that you have never read and never will read. That others may display more constancy is still my hope. The tale was written years ago for a particular audience and, I may say, in rivalry with a particular author. I think I should do well to name him Mr. Alfred R. Phillips. It was not without its reward at the time. I could not, indeed, displace Mr. Phillips from his well-won priority, but in the eyes of readers who thought less than nothing of Treasure Island, the Black Arrow was supposed to mark a clear advance. Those who read volumes and those who read story papers belong to different worlds. The verdict on Treasure Island was reversed in the other court. I wonder, will it be the same with its successor? Robert Louis Stevenson at Saranac Lake, April 8, 1888 Prologue John Amendall On a certain afternoon in the late springtime, the bell upon Tunstall Moat House was heard ringing at an unaccustomed hour. Far and near, in the forest and in the fields along the river, people began to desert their labors and hurry towards the sound, and in Tunstall Hamlet a group of poor country folk stood wondering at the summons. Tunstall Hamlet at that period, in the reign of old King Henry the Sixth, wore much the same appearance as it wears today. A score or so of houses, heavily framed with oak, stood scattered in a long green valley ascending from the river. At the foot the road crossed a bridge and mounting on the other side, disappeared into the fringes of the forest on its way to the moat house, and further forth to Holywood Abbey. Halfway up the village, the church stood among yews. On every side the slopes were crowned and the view bounded by the green elms and greening oak trees of the forest. Hard by the bridge there was a stone cross upon a knoll, and here the group had collected, half a dozen women and one tall fellow in a russet smock, discussing what the bell betided. An express had gone through the hamlet half an hour before, and drunk a pot of ale in the saddle, not daring to dismount for the hurry of his errand, but he had been ignorant himself of what was forward, and only bore sealed letters from Sir Daniel Brackley to Sir Oliver Oates, the parson, who kept the moat-house in the master's absence. But now there was the noise of a horse, and soon, out of the edge of the wood and over the echoing bridge, there rode up young Master Richard Shelton, Sir Daniel's ward. He at the least would know, and they hailed him and begged him to explain. He drew bridle willingly enough. A young fellow, not yet eighteen, sun-browned and grey-eyed, in a jacket of deer's leather, with a black velvet collar, a green hood upon his head, and a steel crossbow at his back. The express, it appeared, 
had brought great news. A battle was impending. Sir Daniel had sent for every man that could draw a bow or carry a bill to go post-haste to Ketley, under pain of his severe displeasure. But for whom they were to fight, or of where the battle was expected, Dick knew nothing. Sir Oliver would come shortly himself, and Bennet Hatch was arming at that moment, for he it was who should lead the party. "'It is the ruin of this kind land,' a woman said. "'If the barons live at war, plough-folk must eat roots.' "'Nay,' said Dick, "'every man that follows shall have sixpence a day, and archers twelve. "'If they live,' returned the woman, "'that may very well be. "'But how if they die, my master?' "'They cannot better die than for their natural lord,' said Dick. "'No natural lord of mine,' said the man in the smock. "'I followed the Walsinghams, so we all did down Briarley Way, till two years ago come Candlemas. And now I must side with Brackley. It was the law that did it. Call ye that natural? But now, what with Sir Daniel and what with Sir Oliver, that knows more of law than honesty, I have no natural lord but poor King Harry the Sixth, God bless him!' the poor innocent that cannot tell his right hand from his left. "'You speak with an ill tongue, friend,' answered Dick, "'to miscall your good master and my lord the king in the same libel. But King Harry, praise be the saints, has come again into his right mind, and will have all things peaceably ordained. And as for Sir Daniel, you are very brave behind his back. But I will be no tale-bearer.' and let that suffice. "'I say no harm of you, Master Richard,' returned the peasant. "'You are a lad, but when you come to a man's inches, you will find you have an empty pocket. I say no more. The saints help Sir Daniel's neighbours, and the blessed maid protect his wards.' "'Clipsby,' said Richard, "'you speak what I cannot hear with honour. Sir Daniel is my good master and my guardian. Come now, will you read me a riddle? returned Clipsby. On whose side is Sir Daniel? I know not, said Dick, colouring a little, for his guardian had changed sides continually in the troubles of that period, and every change had brought him some increase of fortune. Ay, returned Clipsby. You nor no man, for, indeed, he is one that goes to bed Lancaster and gets up York. Just then the bridge rang under horseshoe iron, and the party turned and saw Bennet Hatch come galloping, a brown-faced, grizzled fellow, heavy of hand and grim of mien, armed with sword and spear, a steel sallet on his head, a leather jack upon his body. He was a great man in these parts— Sir Daniel's right hand in peace and war, and at that time, by his master's interest, bailiff of the hundred. Clipsby, he shouted, off to the moat house and send all the other laggards the same gate. Bowyer will give you jack and sallet. We must ride before curfew. Look to it. He that is last at the lich gate, Sir Daniel shall reward. Look to it right well. I know you for a man of naught. Nance, he added, to one of the women, "'Is old Appleyard uptown?' "'I'll warrant you,' replied the woman. "'In his field, for sure.' So the group dispersed, and while Clipsby walked leisurely over the bridge, Bennet and young Shelton rode up the road together, through the village, and past the church. "'You will see the old shrew,' said Bennet. "'He will waste more time grumbling and prating of Harry V than would serve a man to shoe a horse.' and all because he has been to the French wars. The house to which they were bound was the last in the village, standing alone among lilacs, and beyond it, on three sides, there was open meadow rising towards the borders of the wood. Hatch dismounted, threw his rein over the fence, and walked down the field, Dick keeping close at his elbow, to where the old soldier was digging, knee-deep in his cabbages, and now and again, in a cracked voice, singing a snatch of song. He was all dressed in leather, 
only his hood and tippet were a black frieze and tied with scarlet. His face was like a walnut shell, both for color and wrinkles, but his old gray eye was still clear enough and his sight unabated. Perhaps he was deaf. Perhaps he thought it unworthy of an old archer of Agincourt to pay any heed to such disturbances, but neither the surly notes of the alarm bell, nor the near approach of Bennet and the lad, appeared at all to move him, and he continued obstinately digging, and piped up very thin and shaky, "'Now, dear lady, if thy will be, I pray that you will rue on me.' "'Nick Appleyard,' said Hatch, "'Sir Oliver commends him to you, and bids that ye should come within this hour to the moat-house, there to take command.' The old fellow looked up. "'Save you, my masters,' he said, grinning. "'And where goeth Master Hatch?' "'Master Hatch is off to Ketley, with every man that we can horse,' returned Bennet. "'There is a fight toward, it seems, and my lord stays a reinforcement.' "'Ay, verily,' returned Appleyard. "'And what will ye leave me to garrison withal?' "'I leave ye six good men, and Sir Oliver to boot,' answered Hatch. "'It'll not hold the place,' said Appleyard. "'The number sufficeth not. It would take two score to make it good.' "'Why, it's for that we came to you, old shrew,' replied the other. Who else is there but you that could do aught in such a house with such a garrison? Aye, when the pinch comes, ye remember the old shoe, returned Nick. There is not a man of you can back a horse or hold a bill. And as for archery, St. Michael, if old Harry the Fifth were back again, he would stand and let ye shoot at him for a farthing a shoot. "'Nay, Nick, there's some can draw a good bow yet,' said Bennet. "'Draw a good bow!' cried Appleyard. "'Yes, but who'll shoot me a good shoot? It's there the eye comes in, and the head between your shoulders. Now, what might you call a long shoot, Bennet Hatch?' "'Well,' said Bennet, looking about him, "'it would be a long shoot from here into the forest.' "'Aye, it would be a longish shoot,' said the old fellow, turning to look over his shoulder, and then he put up his hand over his eyes and stood staring. "'Why, what are you looking at?' asked Bennet with a chuckle. "'Do you see Harry the Fifth? The veteran continued looking up the hill in silence. The sun shone broadly over the shelving meadows, a few white sheep wandered browsing, all was still but the distant jangle of the bell. "'What is it, Appleyard?' asked Dick. "'Why, the birds,' said Appleyard. And, sure enough, over the top of the forest, where it ran down in a tongue among the meadows, and ended in a pair of goodly green elms, about a bowshot from the field where they were standing, a flight of birds was skimming to and fro, in evident disorder. "'What of the birds?' said Bennet. Ay, returned Appleyard, you're a wise man to go to war, Master Bennet. Birds are a good sentry. In forest places they be the first line of battle. Look you now, if we lay here in camp, there might be archers skulking down to get the wind of us, and here would you be none the wiser. Why, old shrew, said Hatch, there be no man nearer to us than Sir Daniel's at Ketley. Ye are as safe as in London Tower, and ye raise scares upon a man for a few chaffinches and sparrows. Hear him, grinned Appleyard. How many a rogue would give his two crop ears to have a shoot at either of us? St. Michael, man, they hate us like two polecats. Well, sooth it is, they hate Sir Daniel answered Hatch, a little sobered. "'Aye, they hate Sir Daniel, and they hate every man that serves with him,' said Appleyard. "'And in the first order of hating, they hate Bennet Hatch and old Nicholas the Bowman. See ye here, if there was a stout fellow yonder in the wood edge, and you and I stood fair for him, as by St. George we stand, which, think ye, would he choose?' "'You for a good wager.' answered Hatch. 
"'My surcoat to a leather belt, it would be you!' cried the old archer. "'You burn Grimstone, Bennet. They'll ne'er forgive you that, my master. And as for me, I'll soon be in a good place, God grant, and out of bow-shoot, ay, and cannon-shoot, of all their malices. I am an old man, and draw fast to homeward, where the bed is ready. But for you, Bennet, you are to remain behind here at your own peril, and if you come to my ears unhanged, the old, true blue English spirit will be dead. "'You are the shrewestest old dolt in Tunstall Forest,' returned Hatch, visibly ruffled by these threats. "'Get you to your arms before Sir Oliver come, and leave prating for one good while. And ye had talked so much with Harry V, his ears would have been richer than his pocket.' An arrow sang in the air, like a huge hornet, it struck old Appleyard between the shoulder-blades, and pierced him clean through, and he fell forward on his face among the cabbages. Hatch, with a broken cry, leaped into the air, then, stooping double, he ran for the cover of the house. And in the meanwhile Dick Shelton had dropped behind a lilac, and had his crossbow bent and shouldered, covering the point of the forest. Not a leaf stirred. The sheep were patiently browsing. The birds had settled. But there lay the old man, with a cloth-yard arrow standing in his back, and there were Hatch holding to the gable, and Dick crouching and ready behind the lilac bush. "'Do you see aught?' cried Hatch. "'Not a twig stirs,' said Dick. "'I think shame to leave him lying,' said Bennet, coming forward once more with hesitating steps and a very pale countenance. "'Keep a good eye on the wood, Master Shelton. Keep a clear eye on the wood. The saints a soil us. Here was a good shoot.' Bennet raised the old archer on his knee. He was not yet dead. His face worked, and his eyes shut and opened like machinery, and he had a most horrible, ugly look of one in pain. "'Can you hear, old Nick?' asked Hatch. "'Have you a last wish before you wind, old brother?' "'Pluck out the shaft, and let me pass a Mary's name,' gasped Appleyard. "'I be done with old England. Pluck it out!' "'Master Dick,' said Bennet, "'come hither and pull me a good pull upon the arrow. He would fain pass the poor sinner.' Dick laid down his crossbow, and pulling hard upon the arrow, drew it forth. A gush of blood followed. The old archer scrambled half upon his feet, called once upon the name of God, and then fell dead. Hatch, upon his knees among the cabbages, prayed fervently for the welfare of the passing spirit. But even as he prayed it was plain that his mind was still divided, and he kept ever an eye upon the corner of the wood from which the shot had come. When he had done, he got to his feet again, drew off one of his mailed gauntlets, and wiped his pale face, which was all wet with terror. Aye, he said, it'll be my turn next. Who hath done this, Bennet? Richard asked, still holding the arrow in his hand. Nay, hey, the saints know, said Hatch. Here are a good two score Christian souls that we have hunted out of house and holding, he and I. He has paid his shot, poor shrew, nor will it be long, mayhap, ere I pay mine. Sir Daniel driveth over hard. "'This is a strange shaft,' said the lad, looking at the arrow in his hand. "'Aye, by my faith!' cried Bennet. "'Black and black-feathered! Here is an ill-favoured shaft, by my sooth, for black, they say, bodes burial. And here be words written. Wipe the blood away. What read ye?' "'Apple Yard from John Amendall,' read Shelton. What should this betoken? Nay, I like it not, returned the retainer, shaking his head. John Amendall, here is a rogue's name for those that be up in the world. But why stand we here to make a mark? Take him by the knees, good Master Shelton, while I lift him by the shoulders, and let us lay him in his house. This will be a rare shog to poor Sir Oliver. He will turn paper color. He will pray like a windmill. They took up the old archer and carried him between them into his house, where he had dwelt alone, 
and there they laid him on the floor, out of regard for the mattress, and sought, at best they might, to straighten and compose his limbs. Appleyard's house was clean and bare. There was a bed with a blue cover, a cupboard, a great chest, a pair of joint stools, a hinged table in the chimney corner, and hung upon the wall the old soldier's armory of bows and defensive armor. Hatch began to look about him curiously. "'Nick had money,' he said. "'He may have had threescore pounds put by. I would I could light upon it. When you lose an old friend, Master Richard, the best consolation is to air him. See now this chest. I would go a mighty wager there is a bushel of gold therein. He had a strong hand to get, and a hard hand to keep withal, had Appleyard the archer. Now may God rest his spirit. Near eighty year he was afoot and about, and ever getting. But now he's on the broad of his back, poor shrew, and no more lacketh. And if his chattels come to a good friend, he would be merrier, methinks, in heaven. Come, Hatch, said Dick. Respect his stone-blind eyes. Would you rob the man before his body? Nay, he would walk. Hatch made several signs of the cross, but by this time his natural complexion had returned, and he was not easily to be dashed from any purpose. It would have gone hard with the chest had not the gate sounded, and presently after the door of the house opened and admitted a tall, portly, ruddy, black-eyed man of near fifty, in a surplice and black robe. Appleyard, the newcomer was saying as he entered, but he stopped dead. Ave Maria, he cried, saints be our shield. What cheer is this? Cold cheer with Appleyard, Sir Parson, answered Hatch with perfect cheerfulness. Shot at his own door, and alighteth even now at purgatory gates. Ay there, if tales be true, he shall lack neither coal nor candle. Sir Oliver groped his way to a joint stool and sat down upon it, sick and white. This is a judgment, oh, a great stroke, he sobbed, and rattled off a leash of prayers. Hatch, meanwhile, reverently doffed his sallet and knelt down. Ay, Bennet, said the priest, somewhat recovering, and what may this be? What enemy hath done this? Here, Sir Oliver, is the arrow. See, it is written upon with words, said Dick. Nay, cried the priest, this is a foul hearing. John Amendall, a right lollardy word, and black of hue as for an omen. Sirs, this knave arrow likes me not, but it importeth rather to take counsel. Who should this be? Bethink you, Bennet, of so many black ill-willers, which should he be that doth so heartily outface us? Simnel? I do much question it. The Walsinghams? Nay, they are not yet so broken, and they still think to have the law over us when times change. There was Simon Malmesbury, too. How think ye, Bennet? What think ye, sir? returned Hatch. Of Ellis Duckworth. Nay, Bennet, never. Nay, not he said the priest. There cometh never any rising, Bennet, from below. So all judicious chroniclers concord in their opinion. But rebellion travelleth ever downward from above. And when Dick, Tom, and Harry take them to their bills, look ever narrowly to see what lord is profited thereby. Now Sir Daniel, having once more joined him to the Queen's party, is in ill odour with the Yorkist lords. Thence, Bennet, comes the blow, by what procuring I yet seek, but therein lies the nerve of this discomfiture. And it please you, Sir Oliver, said Bennet, the axles are so hot in this country that I have long been smelling fire. So did this poor sinner, Appleyard. And, by your leave, men's spirits are so foully inclined to all of us that it needs neither York nor Lancaster to spur them on. Hear my plain thoughts. You, that are a clerk, and Sir Daniel, that sails on any wind, ye have taken many men's goods, and beaten and hanged not a few. Ye are called to count for this. In the end, I wot not how, 
"'Ye have ever the uppermost at law, and ye think all patched. "'But give me leave, Sir Oliver. "'The man that ye have dispossessed and beaten is but the angrier. "'And some day, when the black devil is by, "'he will up with his bow and clout me a yard of arrow through your inwards.' "'Nay, Bennet, ye are in the wrong. "'Bennet, ye should be glad to be corrected,' said Sir Oliver. "'Ye are a prater, Bennet, a talker, a babbler. "'Your mouth is wider than your two ears. "'Mend it, Bennet, mend it.' "'Nay, I say no more. "'Have it as ye list,' said the retainer. "'The priest now rose from the stool, "'and from the writing-case that hung about his neck "'took forth wax and a taper and a flint and steel.' With these he sealed up the chest and the cupboard with Sir Daniel's arms, Hatch looking on disconsolate, and then the whole party proceeded, somewhat timorously, to sally from the house and get to horse. "'Tis time we were on the road, Sir Oliver,' said Hatch, as he held the priest's stirrup while he mounted. "'Aye, but, Bennet, things are changed,' returned the parson. "'There is now no apple-yard, rest his soul, to keep the garrison.' I shall keep you, Bennet. I must have a good man to rest me on in this day of black arrows. The arrow that flieth by day, saith the evangel. I have no mind of the context. <laughs> Nay, I am a sluggard priest. I am too deep in men's affairs. Well, let us ride forth, Master Hatch. The jackman should be at the church by now. So they rode forward down the road, with a wind after them, blowing the tails of the parson's cloak, and behind them, as they went, clouds began to arise and blot out the sinking sun. They had passed three of the scattered houses that make up Tunstall Hamlet, when, coming to a turn, they saw the church before them. Ten or a dozen houses clustered immediately round it, but to the back the churchyard was next the meadows. At the lich gate near a score of men were gathered, some in the saddle, some standing by their horses' heads. They were variously armed and mounted, some with spears, some with bills, some with bows, and some bestriding plough-horses still splashed with the mire of the furrow, for these were the very dregs of the country, and all the better men and the fair equipments were already with Sir Daniel in the field. "'We have not done amiss, praise be the cross of Holywood. Sir Daniel will be right well content.' observed the priest, inwardly numbering the troop. "'Who goes? Stand, if ye be true!' shouted Bennet. A man was seen slipping through the churchyard among the ewes, and at the sound of this summons he discarded all concealment and fairly took to his heels for the forest. The men at the gate, who had been hitherto unaware of the stranger's presence, woke and scattered. Those who had dismounted began scrambling into the saddle. The rest rode in pursuit, but they had to make the circuit of the consecrated ground, and it was plain their quarry would escape them. Hatch, roaring an oath, put his horse at the hedge to head him off, but the beast refused and sent his rider sprawling in the dust. And though he was up again in a moment, and had caught the bridle, the time had gone by, and the fugitive had gained too great a lead for any hope of capture. The wisest of all had been Dick Shelton. Instead of starting in a vain pursuit, he had whipped his crossbow from his back, bent it, and set a quarrel to the string, and now when the others had desisted, he turned to Bennet and asked if he should shoot. "'Shoot! Shoot!' cried the priest with sanguinary violence. "'Cover him, Master Dick,' said Bennet. "'Bring me him down like a ripe apple.' The fugitive was now within but a few leaps of safety, but this last part of the meadow ran very steeply uphill and the man ran slower in proportion. What with the grayness of the falling night and the uneven movements of the runner, it was no easy aim, and as Dick leveled his bow, he felt a kind of pity and a half-desire that he might miss. The quarrel sped. The man stumbled and fell, and a great cheer arose from Hatch and the pursuers. But they were counting their corn before the harvest. The man fell lightly, he was lightly afoot again, turned and waved his cap in a bravado, and was out of sight next moment in the margin of the wood. "'And the plague go with him!' cried Bennet. "'He has thieves' heels. He can run by St. Bantbury. But you touched him, Master Shelton. 
He has stolen your quarrel. May he never have good. I grudge him less. Nay, but what made he by the church? asked Sir Oliver. I am shrewdly afeard there has been mischief here. Clipsby, good fellow, get you down from your horse, and search thoroughly among the ewes. Clipsby was gone but a little while ere he returned, carrying a paper. This writing was pinned to the church door, he said, handing it to the parson. I found naught else, Sir Parson. Now, by the power of Mother Church, cried Sir Oliver, but this runs hard on sacrilege. For the king's good pleasure, or the lord of the manor, well, but that every run the hedge in a green jerkin should fasten papers to the chancel door, nay, it runs hard on sacrilege, hard, and men have burned for matters of less weight. But what have we here? The light falls apace. Good Master Richard, you have young eyes. Read me, I pray, this libel. Dick Shelton took the paper in his hand and read it aloud. It contained some lines of very rugged doggerel, hardly even rhyming, written in a gross character and most uncouthly spelt. With the spelling somewhat bettered, this is how they ran. I had four black arrows under my belt, four for the griefs that I have felt, four for the number of ill men that have oppressed me now and then. One is gone. One is well sped. Old Appleyard is dead. One is for Maester Bennet Hatch, that burned Grimstone, Walls and Thatch. One for Sir Oliver Oates, that cut Sir Harry Shelton's throat. Sir Daniel, ye shall have the fourth. We shall think it fair sport. You shall each have your own part, a black arrow in each black heart. Get you to your knees for to pray. You are dead thieves by yea and nay. Signed, John Amendall of the Greenwood and his jolly fellowship. Item, we have more arrows and good hempen cord for others of your following. Now, well a day for charity and the Christian graces, cried Sir Oliver lamentably. Sirs, this is an ill world and groweth daily worse. I will swear upon the cross of Holywood I am as innocent of that good knight's hurt, whether in act or purpose, as the babe unchristened. Neither was his throat cut, for therein they are again in error, as there still live credible witnesses to show. It boots not, Sir Parson, said Bennet. Here is unseasonable talk. Nay, Master Bennet, not so. Keep ye in your due place, good Bennet answered the priest. I shall make mine innocence appear. I will, upon no consideration, lose my poor life in error. I take all men to witness that I am clear of this matter. I was not even in the moat-house. I was sent of an errand before nine upon the clock. Sir Oliver, said Hatch, interrupting, since it please you not to stop this sermon, I will take other means. Goff, sound to horse. And while the tucket was sounding, Bennet moved close to the bewildered parson and whispered violently in his ear. Dick Shelton saw the priest's eye turned upon him for an instant in a startled glance. He had some cause for thought, for this Sir Harry Shelton was his own natural father. But he said never a word, and kept his countenance unmoved. Hatch and Sir Oliver discussed together for a while their altered situation. Ten men, it was decided between them, should be reserved, not only to garrison the moat-house, but to escort the priests across the wood. In the meantime, as Bennet was to remain behind, the command of the reinforcement was given to Master Shelton. Indeed, there was no choice. The men were loutish fellows, dull and unskilled in war, while Dick was not only popular, but resolute and grave beyond his age. Although his youth had been spent in these rough country places, the lad had been well taught in letters by Sir Oliver, and Hatch himself had shown him the management of arms and the first principles of command. Bennet had always been kind and helpful. He was one of those who are cruel as the grave to those they call their enemies, but ruggedly faithful and well-willing to their friends. And now, 
while Sir Oliver entered the next house to write, in his swift, exquisite penmanship, a memorandum of the last occurrences to his master, Sir Daniel Brackley, Bennet came up to his pupil to wish him Godspeed upon his enterprise. "'You must go the long way about, Master Shelton,' he said. "'Round by the bridge for your life. Keep a sure man fifty paces afore you to draw shots, and go softly till you are past the wood. If the rogues fall upon you, ride for it. You will do naught by standing. And keep ever forward, Master Shelton. Turn me not back again, and you love your life. There is no help in Tunstall, mind you that. And now, since you go to the great wars about the king, and I continue to dwell here in extreme jeopardy of my life, and the saints alone can certify if we shall meet again below, I give you my last counsels now at your writing. Keep an eye on Sir Daniel. He is unsure. Put not your trust in the jack-priest. He intendeth not amiss, but doth the will of others. It is a handgun for Sir Daniel. Get your good lordship where you go. Make you strong friends. Look to it. And think ever a paternoster while on Bennet Hatch. There are worse rogues afoot than Bennet. So, God speed. And heaven be with you, Bennet, returned Dick. You were a good friend to me, Ward, and so I shall say ever. And look ye, master, added Hatch with a certain embarrassment. If this amendall should get a shaft into me, you might mayhap lay out a gold mark or mayhap a pound for my poor soul, for it is like to go stiff with me in purgatory. You shall have your will of it, Bennet, answered Dick. But what cheer, man! We shall meet again, where you shall have more need of ale than masses. The saints so grant it, Master Dick, returned the other. But here comes Sir Oliver, and he were as quick with the longbow as with the pen. He would be a brave man at arms. Sir Oliver gave Dick a sealed packet with this superscription. To my right worshipful master, Sir Daniel Brackley, knight, be this delivered in haste. And Dick, putting it in the bosom of his jacket, gave the word and set forth westward up the village. Book One, The Two Lads, Chapter One, At the Sign of the Sun in Ketley Sir Daniel and his men lay in and about Ketley that night, warmly quartered and well patrolled. But the knight of Tunstall was one who never rested from money-getting, and even now, when he was on the brink of an adventure which should make or mar him, he was up an hour after midnight to squeeze poor neighbors. He was one who trafficked greatly in disputed inheritances. It was his way to buy out the most unlikely claimant, and then, by the favor he curried with great lords about the king, procure unjust decisions in his favor, or, if that was too roundabout, to seize the disputed manner by force of arms, and rely on his influence and Sir Oliver's cunning in the law, to hold what he had snatched. Ketley was one such place. It had come very lately into his clutches. He still met with opposition from the tenants and it was to overall discontent that he had led his troops that way. By two in the morning Sir Daniel sat in the inn room, close by the fireside, for it was cold at that hour among the fens of Ketley. By his elbow stood a puddle of spiced ale. He had taken off his visored headpiece, and sat with his bald head and thin, dark visage resting on one hand, wrapped warmly in a sanguine-colored cloak. At the lower end of the room, about a dozen of his men stood sentry over the door, or lay asleep on benches, and, somewhat nearer hand, a young lad, apparently of twelve or thirteen, was stretched in a mantle on the floor. The host of the sun stood before the great man. "'Now mark me, mine host,' Sir Daniel said. "'Follow but mine orders, and I shall be your good lord ever.' I must have good men for headboroughs, and I will have Adam a more high constable. See to it narrowly. If other men be chosen, it shall avail you nothing. Rather it shall be found to your sore cost. For those that have paid rent to Walsingham I shall take good measure. You among the rest, mine host. Good night, 
said the host, I will swear upon the cross of Holywood I did but pay to Walsingham upon compulsion. Nay, bully knight, I love not the rogue Walsinghams. They were as poor as thieves, bully knight. Give me a great lord like you. Nay, ask me among the neighbours. I am stout for Brackley. It may be, said Sir Daniel dryly. You shall then pay twice. The innkeeper made a horrid grimace, but this was a piece of bad luck that might readily befall a tenant in these unruly times, and he was perhaps glad to make his peace so easily. "'Bring up yon fellow, Selden,' cried the knight, and one of his retainers led up a poor, cringing old man, as pale as a candle, and all shaking with the fen fever. "'Sirrah,' said Sir Daniel, "'your name?' "'And it please your worship,' replied the man. "'My name is Condal, Condal of Shoreby, at your good worship's pleasure.' "'I have heard you ill-reported on,' returned the knight. "'Ye deal in treason, rogue. "'Ye trudge the country leasing. "'Ye are heavily suspicioned of the death of severals. "'How, fella, are ye so bold? "'But I will bring you down.' Ah, oh, right, honourable and my reverend lord, the man cried, here is some hodgepodge, saving your good presence. I am but a poor private man, and have hurt none. The under-sheriff did report of you most vilely, said the knight. Seize me, saith he, that Tyndall of Shoreby. Condal, my good lord, Condal is my poor name said the unfortunate. "'Condal or Tyndall, it is all one,' replied Sir Daniel, coolly. "'For by my sooth ye are here, and I do mightily suspect your honesty. If you would save your neck, write me swiftly an obligation for twenty pound.' "'For twenty pound, my good lord,' cried Condal, "'here is midsummer madness. My whole estate amounteth not to seventy shillings.' Condal or Tyndall, returned Sir Daniel, grinning, I will run my peril of that loss, write me down twenty, and when I have recovered all I may, I will be good lord to you, and pardon you the rest. Alas, my good lord, it may not be, I have no skill to write, said Condal. Well a day, returned the knight, here then is no remedy. Yet— I would fain have spared you, Tyndall, had my conscience suffered. Selden, take me this old shrew softly to the nearest elm, and hang me him tenderly by the neck, where I may see him at my riding. Fare ye well, good Master Condal, dear Master Tyndall. Ye are post-haste for paradise. Fare ye then well. Nay, my bright pleasant lord, replied Condal, forcing an obsequious smile. And ye be so masterful, as doth right well become you, I will even, with all my poor skill, do your good bidding. Friend, quoth Sir Daniel, you will now write two score. Go to, you are too cunning for a livelihood of seventy shillings. Seldom see him write me this in good form and have it duly witnessed. And Sir Daniel, who was a very merry knight, none merrier in England, took a drink of his mulled ale and lay back, smiling. Meanwhile, the boy upon the floor began to stir, and presently sat up and looked about him with a scare. Hither, said Sir Daniel, and as the other rose at his command and came slowly towards him, he leaned back and laughed outright. By the rood, he cried, a sturdy boy! The lad flushed crimson with anger, and darted a look of hate out of his dark eyes. Now that he was on his legs, it was more difficult to make certain of his age. His face looked somewhat older in expression, but it was as smooth as a young child's, and in bone and body he was unusually slender, and somewhat awkward of gait. "'Ye have called me, Sir Daniel,' he said. "'Was it to laugh at my poor plight?' "'Nay, now, let laugh,' said the knight. "'Good shrew, let laugh, I pray you. 
and you could see yourself, I warrant ye, would laugh the first. Well, cried the lad, flushing, ye shall answer this when ye answer for the other. Laugh while well yet ye may. Nay, now, good cousin, replied Sir Daniel, with some earnestness, think not that I mock at you except in mirth, as between kinsfolk and singular friends. I will make you a marriage of a thousand pounds, go to, and cherish you exceedingly. I took you, indeed, roughly, as the time demanded, but from henceforth I shall ungrudgingly maintain and cheerfully serve you. Ye shall be Mrs. Shelton, Lady Shelton by my troth, for the lad promiseth bravely. Tut! ye will not shy for honest laughter, it purgeth melancholy. They are no rogues who laugh, good cousin. Good mine host, lay me a meal now for my cousin, Master John. Sit ye down, sweetheart, and eat. Nay, said Master John, I will break no bread. Since ye force me to the sin, I will fast for my soul's interest. But, good mine host, I pray you of courtesy, give me a cup of fair water. I shall be much beholden to your courtesy indeed. You shall have a dispensation, go to, cried the knight. Shalt be well shriven by my faith. Content you then, and eat. But the lad was obstinate, drank a cup of water, and, once more wrapping himself closely in his mantle, sat in a far corner, brooding. In an hour or two there rose a stir in the village of sentries challenging, and the clatter of arms and horses, and then a troop drew up by the inn door, and Richard Shelton, splashed with mud, presented himself upon the threshold. "'Save you, Sir Daniel,' he said. "'Ow, oh, Dicky Shelton!' cried the knight, and at the mention of Dick's name the other lad looked curiously across. "'What maketh Benneth Hatch?' Please you, Sir Knight, to take cognizance of this packet from Sir Oliver, wherein are all things fully stated, answered Richard, presenting the priest's letter. And please you farther, you were best make all speed to Risingham, for on the way hither we encountered one riding furiously with letters, and by his report my lord of Risingham were sore bested, and lacked exceedingly your presence. How say you, sore bested? returned the knight. "'Nay, then we will make speed sitting down, good Richard. "'As the world goes in this poor realm of England, "'he that rideth softliest rides surest. "'Delay, they say, begetteth peril. "'But it is rather this itch of doing that undoes men. "'Mark it, Dick. "'But let me see first what cattle he have brought. "'Selden, a link here at the door.' "'And Sir Daniel strode forth into the village street,' and by the red glow of a torch inspected his new troops. He was an unpopular neighbor, and an unpopular master, but as a leader in war he was well beloved by those who rode behind his pennant. His dash, his proved courage, his forethought for the soldier's comfort, even his rough jibes, were all to the taste of the bold blades in jack and salad. "'Nay, by the rood!' he cried. "'What poor dogs are these!' Here be some as crooked as a bow, and some as lean as a spear. Friends, ye shall ride in the front of the battle. I can spare you, friends. Mark me this old villain on the piebald. A two-year mutton riding on a hog would look more soldierly. Ha! <laughs> Clipsby, are you there, old rat? Ye are a man I could lose with a good heart. Ye shall go in front of all, with a bull's-eye painted on your jack, to be the better butt for archery. Sirrah, you shall show me the way. I will show you any way, Sir Daniel, but the way to change sides, returned Clipsby sturdily. Sir Daniel laughed a guffaw. Why, well said, he cried. Hast a shrewd tongue in thy mouth, go to. <laughs> I will forgive you for that merry word. <laughs> Selden, see them fed both man and brute. The knight re-entered the inn. Now, Fred and Dick, he said, fall to. Here is good ale and bacon. Eat while that I read. Sir Daniel opened the packet, and as he read his brow darkened. 
When he had done, he sat a little, musing. Then he looked sharply at his ward. Dick, said he, ye have seen this penny rhyme? The lad replied in the affirmative. It bears your father's name, continued the knight, and our poor shrew of a parson is, by some mad soul, accused of slaying him. He did most eagerly deny it, answered Dick. He did, cried the knight very sharply. Heed him not. He has a loose tongue. He babbles like a jack sparrow. Some day, when I may find the leisure, Dick, I will myself more fully inform you of these matters. There was one Duckworth shrewdly blamed for it, but the times were troubled, and there was no justice to be got. It befell at the moat house? Dick ventured with a beating at his heart. It befell between the moat house and Holywood, replied Sir Daniel calmly but he shot a covert glance, black with suspicion, at Dick's face. "'And now,' added the knight, "'speed you with your meal. Ye shall return to Tunstall with a line from me.' Dick's face fell sorely. "'Prithee, Sir Daniel,' he cried, "'send one of the villains. I beseech you, let me to the battle. I can strike a stroke, I promise you.' "'I misdoubt it not,' replied Sir Daniel, sitting down to write. But here, Dick, is no honour to be won. I lie in Ketley till I have sure tidings of the war, and then ride to join me with the conqueror. Cry not on cowardice, it is but wisdom, Dick, for this poor realm so tosseth with rebellion, and the king's name and custody so changeth hands, that no man may be certain of the morrow. Tosspot and shuttlewit run in, but my lord good counsel sits on one side, waiting. With that, Sir Daniel, turning his back to Dick, and quite at the farther end of the long table, began to write his letter, with his mouth on one side, for this business of the black arrow stuck sorely in his throat. Meanwhile young Shelton was going on heartily enough with his breakfast, when he felt a touch upon his arm, and a very soft voice whispering in his ear. "'Make not a sign, I do beseech you,' said the voice, "'but of your charity.' Tell me the straight way to Holywood. Beseech you now, good boy, comfort a poor soul in peril and extreme distress, and set me so far forth upon the way to my repose. Take the path by the windmill, answered Dick in the same tone. It will bring you to Till Ferry. There inquire again. And without turning his head, he fell again to eating. But with the tail of his eye, he caught a glimpse of the young lad called Master John stealthily creeping from the room. Why, thought Dick, he is as young as I. Good boy doth he call me, and I had known I should have seen the varlet hanged ere I had told him. Well, if he goes through the fen I may come up with him and pull his ears. Half an hour later Sir Daniel gave Dick the letter, and bade him speed to the moat-house, and again, some half an hour after Dick's departure, a messenger came in hot haste from my lord of Risingham. "'Sir Daniel,' the messenger said, "'you lose great honour by my sooth. The fight began again this morning ere the dawn, and we have beaten their van and scattered their right wing. Only the main battle standeth fast, and we had your fresh men we should tilt you them all into the river. What, Sir Knight, will you be the last? It stands not with your good credit.' "'Nay,' cried the knight, I was but now upon the march. Selden, sound me the tucket. Sir, I am with you on the instant. It is not two hours since the more part of my command came in, Sir Messenger. What would you have? Spurring is good meat, but yet it killed the charger. Bustle, boys! By this time the tucket was sounding cheerily in the morning, and from all sides Sir Daniel's men poured into the main street and formed before the inn. They had slept upon their arms, with chargers saddled, and in ten minutes five score men at arms and archers, cleanly equipped and briskly disciplined, stood ranked and ready. The chief part were in Sir Daniel's livery, Murray and Blue, which gave the greater show to their array. The best armed rode first, and away out of sight at the tail of the column came the sorry reinforcement of the night before. Sir Daniel looked with pride along the line. "'Here be the lads to serve you in a pinch,' he said. 
"'They are pretty men, indeed,' replied the messenger. "'It but augments my sorrow that ye had not marched the earlier.' "'Well,' said the knight, "'what would ye? "'The beginning of a feast and the end of a fray, Sir Messenger.' and he mounted into his saddle. "'Why, how now?' he cried. "'John! Joanna! Nay, by the sacred rood, where is she? Host, where is that girl?' "'Girl, Sir Daniel?' cried the landlord. "'Nay, sir, I saw no girl.' "'Boy, then, dotard!' cried the knight. "'Could ye not see it was a wench? She in the murrey coloured mantle. She that broke her fast with water, rogue, where is she?' "'Nay, the saints bless us! Master John, ye called him,' said the host. "'Well, I thought none evil. He is gone. I saw him, uh, her, I saw her in the stable a good hour agone, and was saddling a grey horse.' "'Now by the rood!' cried Sir Daniel. "'The wench was worth five hundred pound to me and more.' "'Sir Knight,' observed the messenger with bitterness, while that ye are here, roaring for five hundred pounds, the realm of England is elsewhere being lost and won. It is well said, replied Sir Daniel. Selden, fall me out with six crossbowmen, hunt me her down. I care not what it cost, but at my returning let me find her at the moat house, be it upon your head. And now, Sir Messenger, we march. And the troop broke into a good trot and Selden and his six men were left behind upon the street of Ketley, with the staring villagers. CHAPTER Two, IN THE FEN It was near six in the May morning when Dick began to ride down into the fen upon his homeward way. The sky was all blue, jolly wind blew loud and steady, the windmill sails were spinning, and the willows over all the fen rippling and whitening like a field of corn. He had been all night in the saddle, but his heart was good, and his body sound, and he rode right merrily. The path went down and down into the marsh, till he lost sight of all the neighboring landmarks but Ketley Windmill on the knoll behind him, and the extreme top of Tunstall Forest far before. On either hand there were great fields of blowing reeds and willows, pools of water shaking in the wind, and treacherous bogs as green as emerald, to tempt and to betray the traveller. The path lay almost straight through the morass. It was already very ancient, its foundation had been laid by Roman soldiery, in the lapse of ages much of it had sunk, and every here and there, for a few hundred yards, it lay submerged below the stagnant waters of the fen. About a mile from Ketley, Dick came to one such break in the plain line of causeway, where the reeds and willows grew dispersedly like little islands and confused the eye. The gap, besides, was more than usually long. It was a place where any stranger might come readily to mischief, and Dick bethought him, with something like a pang, of the lad whom he had so imperfectly directed. As for himself, one looked backward to where the windmill sails were turning black against the blue of heaven, one looked forward to the high ground of Tunstall Forest, and he was sufficiently directed and held straight on, the water washing to his horse's knees, as safe as on a highway. Halfway across, and when he had already sighted the path rising high and dry upon the farther side, he was aware of a great splashing on his right, and saw a grey horse sunk to its belly in the mud, and still spasmodically struggling. Instantly, as though it had divined the neighborhood of help, the poor beast began to neigh most piercingly. It rolled, meanwhile, a bloodshot eye, insane with terror, and as it sprawled wallowing in the quag, clouds of stinging insects rose and buzzed about it in the air. Alack, thought Dick, can the poor lad have perished? There is his horse for certain, a brave grey. Nay, comrade, if thou criest to me so piteously, I will do all man can to help thee. Shalt not lie there to drown by inches. And he made ready his crossbow, and put a quarrel through the creature's head. Dick rode on after this act of rugged mercy, somewhat sobered in spirit, and looking closely about him for any sign of his less happy predecessor in the way. I would I had dared to tell him further, he thought for I fear he has miscarried in the slough. 
and just as he was so thinking, a voice cried upon his name from the causeway side, and looking over his shoulder, he saw the lad's face peering from a clump of reeds. "'Are you there?' he said, reining in. "'You lay so close among the reeds that I had passed you by. I saw your horse bemired, and put him from his agony, which, by my sooth, and ye have been a more merciful rider, ye had done yourself. But come forth out of your hiding. Here be none to trouble you. "'Nay, good boy, I have no arms, nor skill to use them if I had,' replied the other, stepping forth upon the pathway. "'Why call me boy?' cried Dick. "'Ye are not, I trow, the elder of us twain.' "'Good Master Shelton,' said the other, "'prithee forgive me. I have none the least intention to offend. Rather I would in every way beseech your gentleness and favour, for I am now worse bested than ever, having lost my way, my cloak, and my poor horse. To have a riding-rod and spurs, and never a horse to sit upon. And before all,' he added, looking ruefully upon his clothes, before all to be so sorely besmirched. Tut, cried Dick, would you mind a ducking? Blood of wound or dust of travel, that's a man's adornment. Nay, then, I like him better plain, observed the lad. But prithee, how shall I do? Prithee, good Master Richard, help me with your good counsel. If I come not safe to Holywood, I am undone. Nay, said Dick, dismounting. I will give more than counsel. Take my horse, and I will run a while, and when I am weary we shall change again, so that, riding and running, both may go the speedier. So the change was made, and they went forward as briskly as they durst on the uneven causeway, Dick with his hand upon the other's knee. "'How call ye your name?' asked Dick. "'Call me John Matcham,' replied the lad. "'And what make ye to Holywood?' Dick continued. "'I seek sanctuary from a man that would oppress me,' was the answer. "'The good abbot of Holywood is a strong pillar to the weak.' "'And how came you with Sir Daniel, Master Matcham?' pursued Dick. "'Nay,' cried the other, "'by the abuse of force. He hath taken me by violence from my own place, dressed me in these weeds, ridden with me till my heart was sick, jibed me till I could have wept, and when certain of my friends pursued, thinking to have me back, claps me in the rear to stand their shot. I was even grazed in the right foot, and walk but lamely. Nay, there shall come a day between us. He shall smart for all. "'Would you shoot at the moon with a handgun?' said Dick. "'Tis a valiant knight, and hath a hand of iron.' and he guessed I had made or meddled with your flight. It would go sore with me. Ay, poor boy, returned the other, ye are his ward, I know it. By the same token, so am I, or so he saith, or else he hath bought my marriage. I, I wot not rightly which, but it is some handle to oppress me by. Boy again, said Dick. "'Nay, then, shall I call you girl, good Richard?' asked Matcham. "'Never a girl for me,' returned Dick. "'I do abjure the crew of them.' "'You speak boyishly,' said the other. "'You think more of them than you pretend.' "'Not I,' said Dick stoutly. "'They come not in my mind. "'A plague of them, say I. "'Give me to hunt and to fight and to feast, "'and to live with jolly foresters.' I never heard of a maid yet that was for any service, save one only, and she, poor shrew, was burned for a witch and the wearing of men's clothes in spite of nature. Master Matcham crossed himself with fervor and appeared to pray. "'What make ye?' Dick inquired. "'I pray for her spirit,' answered the other with a somewhat troubled voice. "'For a witch's spirit?' Dick cried. But pray for her, an ye list. She was the best wench in Europe, was this Joan of Arc. Old Appleyard the archer ran from her, he said, as if she had been Mahoon. Nay, she was a brave wench. 
"'Well, but, good Mr. Richard,' resumed Matcham, "'and you like made so little. Ye are no true natural man, for God made them twain by intention, and brought true love into the world, to be man's hope and woman's comfort.' "'Fah!' said Dick. "'Ye are a milk-sopping baby to so to harp on women. And ye think I be no true man?' Get down upon the path, and whether it fists, backsword, or bow and arrow, I will prove my manhood on your body. Nay, I am no fighter, said Matcham eagerly. I mean no tittle of offence. I meant but pleasantry. And if I talk of women, it is because I heard ye were to marry. I to marry? Dick exclaimed. Well, it is the first I hear of it. "'And with whom was I to marry?' "'One Joan Sedley,' replied Matcham, colouring. "'It was Sir Daniel's doing. "'He hath money to gain upon both sides, "'and, indeed, I have heard the poor wench "'bemoaning herself piteously of the match. "'It seems she is of your mind, "'or else distasted to the bridegroom.' "'Well, marriage is like death, it comes to all,' "'said Dick with resignation. "'And she bemoaned herself? "'I pray you now, see there how shuttle-witted are these girls. "'To bemoan herself before that she has seen me. "'Do I bemoan myself? <laughs> Not I. "'And I be to marry, I will marry dry-eyed. "'But if you know her, prithee, of what favour is she, fair or foul? "'And is she shrewish or pleasant?' "'Nay, what matters it?' said Matcham. "'And ye are to marry, ye can but marry. "'What matters foul or fair? "'These be but toys. "'You are no milksop, Master Richard. "'You will wed with dry eyes anyhow.' "'It is well said,' replied Shelton. "'Little I reck.' "'Your lady wife is like to have a pleasant lord,' said Matcham. "'She shall have the lord heaven made her for,' returned Dick. "'It trow there be worse as well as better.' "'Ah, oh, the poor wench!' cried the other. "'And why so poor?' asked Dick. "'To wed a man of wood,' replied his companion. "'Oh, me, for a wooden husband!' "'I think I be a man of wood indeed,' said Dick, "'to trudge afoot the while you ride my horse. "'It is a good wood, I trow.' "'Good, Dick, forgive me,' cried the other. "'Nay, you are the best heart in England. "'I but laughed. "'Forgive me now, sweet Dick.' "'Nay, no fool words,' returned Dick, "'a little embarrassed by his companion's warmth. "'No harm is done. "'I am not touchy, praise the saints.' "'And at that moment the wind, "'which was blowing straight behind them as they went, "'brought them the rough flourish of Sir Daniel's trumpeter. "'Hark!' said Dick. "'The tucket soundeth.' Ay, said Matcham, they have found my flight, and now I am unhorsed. And he became pale as death. Nay, what cheer, returned Dick. You have a long start, and we are near the ferry. And it is I, methinks, that am unhorsed. Alack, I shall be taken, cried the fugitive. Dick, kind Dick, beseech ye help me but a little. Why now, what aileth thee, said Dick? "'Methinks I help you very patently, but my heart is sorry for so spiritless a fellow. "'And see ye here, John Matcham, Sith John Matcham is your name, "'I, Richard Shelton, tide what betideth, come what may, will see you safe in Holywood. "'The saints so do to me again if I default you. "'Come, pick me up a good heart, Sir Whiteface. "'The way betters here. Spur me the horse. Go faster.' "'Faster! Nay, mind not for me. I can run like a deer.' So, with the horse trotting hard, and Dick running easily alongside, they crossed the remainder of the fen, and came out upon the banks of the river by the ferryman's hut. I hope you enjoyed the unabridged production of The Black Arrow, Part 1 of 9. If you'd like to support the show... You can become an associate or executive producer by donating $10 or more. You'll get your name mentioned in the credits, listed in the show notes, and you can even list yourself on IMDb as a producer of the show. Now, any amount is accepted and appreciated. 
You can find all the details at MedievalTalesPodcast.com. Thank you for listening to the Medieval Tales Podcast. If you are enjoying the show, share it with your friends or blast it out on social media.